Ladies and gentlemen and friends in Christ, I'm tremendously honored this evening, the great privilege I have of being here and addressing this splendid audience this evening. I'm a Tennessee boy, come home. I've been on the West Coast for almost a half century, but my roots are in Tennessee, and I have so many sweet memories of the days of my youth in a little country town called Goodlitzville, 12 miles north of Nashville. And I'm happy to be back with you people tonight from wherever you may come as we assemble here on this occasion to glorify God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands with sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and upon this law he meditates day and night. The general theme of the three lessons that I will give on these three evenings has to do with meditating upon certain exalted thoughts that challenge the mind and yet thrill the soul. And so we need to learn to meditate and to explore the deeper treasures of the Word of God. Let me begin by laying a foundation, if I might, and calling attention to the fact that there are two basic levels of knowledge. There is that level of knowledge that is instinctive, virtually, as one is born into the human family. For example, a child never has to be taught the sucking phenomenon, but is born with that capacity. As we grow older, we begin to assemble a vast array of data bit by bit, point by point, into our minds so that we operate uh, by and by almost on what we might call automatic pilot. We have so much information, we don't have to readily remember it at a given moment in time, but it simply comes to us. You get up in the morning, gentlemen, and you prepare to shave, you don't have to ask yourself, how do I do that this morning? You can do it thinking about many other things. Do it automatically. When you get into your car to go to work, you don't have to say, what do I do first? Oh, yes, turn on the ignition. Put it into gear, back out of the drive, head to the office. You can go through a dozen traffic lights thinking about other things, and generally, as you get to the office, never remember most of the things you saw along the way because you do so much by rote information. But there is a deeper level of knowledge that is deliberately obtained, not simply by soaking it up from the environment, but because you choose to know certain things. You investigate, you analyze, you systematize, you develop logical thoughts concerning material, you ponder them, and you make them a part of your religious essence. We're talking about some things upon which we 
should meditate. The Far Eastern religions have majored in meditation. We've neglected it considerably. But I have learned in my elder years more about how to meditate. I rise early in the morning to go on my walk, usually about 5.30 or so. I start out by praying, and then I begin to meditate. I meditate upon passages from the Bible that I have laid aside in my heart. I think about sermons that I want to give. I plan articles that I would like to write. Sometimes, though, I let my mind wander into areas that are far beyond my capacity to appreciate. And I meditate and meditate upon them. And that's what I intend to try to do with you as we study on these three occasions tonight and the next two nights. I want to call your attention to a passage with which to start. In the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. We don't know who the author was. The superscription doesn't give us any kind of detail. But many scholars believe that it was composed by David. They believe that the style is his. And they believe that the nocturnal allusions in the text reflect someone who observed the night skies frequently and drew certain conclusions from those. But he says, speaking to God, praising God, when I think of you, when I meditate upon you, God, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and the stars, ordinances which you have given, if I may paraphrase, he says, I am constrained to ask the question, what is man that you are mindful of him? That is a profound question, one that challenged the depth of his soul and which he sought to obtain the answers for. And he leaves us hanging to think about it ourselves and to plumb the depths of our minds for possible answers to it. When we survey the amazing chandelier in the heavens at night, and we think about the magnificent creation of God. And we think about ourselves in that context. We ask the question, what are we? Who are we? What are we doing upon this earth? Why did God create us? Generically speaking, and then we could even narrow the focus to ourselves individually and ask the question, how come it is that I am here as an individual on this earth? I could have not been, but I am. How come? To be or not to be, that is the question. And so tonight, let's think about that for a moment. What are we doing upon this planet? Why are we here? 
I want to develop this idea for a few moments, if I might, by looking at the universe of which we are a tiny fragment. Do you have any concept of the vastness of the universe in which we live? Let me answer that for you. No, you do not. <laughs> Nor do I. For the simple reason is the universe has never been measured. We do not know where the west coast is or the east coast or the northern body or border or the south. It is simply an unfathomable mass of matter that we are incapable of plumbing. I read a book some years ago written by a British astronomer who sought to illustrate the vastness of the universe of which we are a part. He said, if I wanted to draw a map of the universe and I had a chalkboard, I would first put a dot in the center of the board and then one inch away I would put another dot. Dot A represents the sun, dot B represents the earth. Now the earth is 93 million miles from the sun. The scale of our map therefore would be one inch equals 93 million miles. He said if we wanted to extend our map to the nearest star that we can see in the night sky, we would have to extend our chalkboard four miles long. That's 5,280 feet per mile, 12 inches in a foot. And each inch represents 93 million miles. He said, if we further still wanted to extend our map to include halfway across our galaxy, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. If we wanted to extend our map halfway across our galaxy, our chalkboard would have to be 25,000 miles long. Divide that or multiply that by the number of feet, by the number of inches, by 93 million miles, and you've got a vast, vast segment of the universe from our perspective, but actually on a, only a tiny bit. The Milky Way galaxy is only one galaxy of billions of galaxies that are beyond our ability to comprehend. And yet on one tiny orb of Earth, here we are, all alone as material objects living biological creatures in the universe. So far as we know, there are no other planets anywhere that have living creatures upon them. Someone once asked N.B. Hardiman, are there people on other planets? And his succinct answer was, faith comes by hearing. I've not heard anything from them. <laughs> Therefore, I cannot say that I believe there are creatures elsewhere. So we ask ourselves, what are we doing here? Why us, only us, on this tiny, tiny piece of earth in all of the unfathomable universe. Now, we can take knowledge that we have at our disposal and go so far 
with certain aspects of this. For example, the psalmist in the passage we looked at a few moments ago in Psalm 8 considered the universe to be not a happy accident, but a product of divine creative power. He said to the Lord, when I reflect upon what has been created by your fingers, he uses figurative language there, of course. When I reflect upon this creation, I am irresistibly led to the conclusion that you are the author of it. You are the framer of it. Moses wrote in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that what appears has not been made out of that which doth appear. God is the creator. There is not a man or a woman alive upon this earth who can give you any kind of rational, sensible explanation for the origin of the universe outside of the fact that it was created by some kind of supernatural, personal mind. Science knows that matter does not have the innate ability to create itself. If matter could create itself, we would be able to observe matter creating itself. But there is no observation of matter coming into existence, as the first law of thermodynamics indicates. Therefore, the universe did not create itself. Secondly, we know the universe is not eternal. We could argue that case from the second law of thermodynamics, but really it would be useless to argue in that vein because of the fact that even the skeptics, the atheists themselves do not dispute the fact that the universe is temporal. When the skeptic tells you that our universe is 20 billion years old, which they contend, he is claiming that it's not eternal. He's put a date to it, a commencement point. So there is no explanation for the creation of matter. There is no explanation for a timeless universe. Consequently, we are irresistibly, logically driven to the conclusion that the universe was creating, created by something that is non-matter namely mind. Mind is the equivalent of personality. Therefore, some kind of personal being is responsible for the creation of the universe. If it is the case that the universe is characterized by pattern or design or an ingenious makeup, then it is the case that the mind or the personality that stands behind it all is highly intelligent. The writer of Psalm 8 drew that conclusion. He was a logician. He reasoned from the known to the unknown, from the simple to the more complex, and concluded, concluded that God is the author of this vast community of which we are a part. But he went further than that. Amazingly, he says, When I consider the stars, the moon, the works of thy hand, I'm constrained to ponder what is man, humanity, that you are mindful of him. You know what the implication is in that statement? There is an implication that states or implies that the universe was made for us. 
when I consider the universe, the stars, the moon. I want to know what is there about us that makes us so special that we are unique in the universe. And that is a magnificent question to ponder. Let me again make a distinction between the two kinds of knowledge. There is that everyday knowledge that we pick up through our sensory perception. And then there is a greater level of knowledge at which we arrive as a consequence of examining evidence and logically drawing conclusions about the evidence that we have. I was reading a book one time written by an atheist, Dr. Carl Sagan, who wrote a book on the human brain. It's called Broca's Brain. And he said that the human brain is so complex and such a magnificent reservoir of information that the brain has the equivalent of a library of 20 million volumes. If you had a shelf stretching from San Francisco to Seattle, it would house all of the books that contain the information in your brain. I remember one day I, after reading this, I approached my wife. <laughs> and I said, would you look at this head let me tell you something about it. Did you know that in my head there is the equivalent of a library of 20 million books? She said, why don't you check one out sometime? <laughs> I used to be dumb. <laughs> now I'm both dumb and humble. <laughs> but I want you to reason with me tonight. I want you to think logically with me for a while this evening. The universe is here. That is an undeniable fact. We are here. That is an undeniable fact. Why are we here. That's a deep question. And I don't propose to give you a definitive answer to it tonight, for I cannot. But there are some things that I want to reflect upon with you as we think about this. Sometimes in analyzing a proposition, I like to approach it from two different vantage points from a positive vantage point and from a negative vantage point. You eliminate the negative and that leaves you with the positive as possible data for analyses. Let me suggest for your consideration why we are not here. And all of us here tonight share the conviction that we are creatures of God. That we were made in His image according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And we happily and thrillingly acknowledge that. You are our God. And we're thankful for it. But why are we here? Some have suggested that God was lonely. And consequently wanted companionship and thus created the human family in order that he might have fellowship with it. We may mark that off the list initially, for it undergirds the very nature of God himself. God is infinite in all of his qualities. 
He cannot be more powerful than he is powerful. He cannot be more brilliant than he is brilliant. And I hesitate to use the word brilliant in connection with God because we use that in connection with human beings. He's beyond brilliant. There is no adequate word to describe his knowledge, the vast reservoir of information that is infinitely and innately a part of his makeup. God has never had a new idea. He's never had a thought that he hasn't had eternally. He is absolutely infinite to the utterly nth degree in every single capacity that he has. You know, as well as I do, that the Bible teaches there are three separate personalities that constitute the nature of God. There is one God, one divine nature. What is the divine nature? It's the sum total of everything that it takes to make a being God versus, for example, an angel or a human being or an animal. God is in a class by himself. The divine nature is the deity nature. But the Bible teaches there are three separate personalities revealed distinctively in the New Testament as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, each of which manifests the nature of deity. I make that point to stress the fact that God is completely self-sufficient within himself, within the members of the Godhead. They are sufficient company for one another for any quote unquote need that they might have which they don't have as a matter of fact so God did not create us because he was lonely as a matter of fact that wouldn't make any logical sense whatsoever because look at how us has turned out I'm talking about the human family generally so we must eradicate that notion I had a conversation once with a very respected gospel preacher, uh, a marvelous man, quite intelligent, deeply spiritual. But we were discussing this matter. And uh, I said, why do you think God created us? He said, well, I don't know, but I think there must have been some reason that he needed us. And so for some need which we cannot define, appreciate, or fathom, he needed us. I said, I don't think that's right. I said, for example, think about the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he was reasoning with the philosophers on Mars Hill. When he said in verse 24, the God who made the world... And all things therein, he being Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with men's hands. Neither is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything. We do not have anything that God needs. He has everything that we need, but we don't satisfy any need that he has. I was holding a gospel meeting up in the state of Washington a number of years ago, and an elderly lady approached me, and she said, Brother Jackson, I've been having a conversation with a young lady who is a student in the university nearby, and she made the statement to me, that even if I could prove to her God exists, she wouldn't want to believe in him because if he does exist and he expects the entire human race to fall down and worship him, he must have an inflated ego that is beyond anything we can possibly imagine. He must be the most egotistical maniac in the whole history of the universe. And so she contended that God commanded us to believe on him, to worship him, to serve him, 
because it inflated his ego, made him feel bigger and better than he initially was. Of course, that is a, an absolutely stupid concept. But have you ever reflected upon this passage? In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7, God, speaking of the human family, says that He created us for His glory. Now, you cannot wrap your mind around that. What does it mean? He created us for His glory. Does that suggest that God felt somewhat diminished in His glory and consequently uh, felt the need to create people to glorify Him? No, it does not. It does not. Let me reflect with you upon a passage momentarily found in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, our Lord's Prayer on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It begins by a conversation in which He explains or states some inner relationship that He has with the Father. Jesus says, I believe in verse number 5, And now, Father, glorify Thou me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus states that He was with God before the world existed and that He shared glory with God at that time. He's now about to go to the cross. He will be buried. He will be resurrected. He will ascend back to the Father and He petitions God that he might resume the glory which he had with God before the world was. Apparently, if you think about the passage logically, that implies that the glory that God now has, which Christ shares with him, is the same degree of glory that he had before the world was ever fashioned which means that God's glory has not increased over the centuries by virtue of the fact that different pit segments of humanity have glorified Him along the way. Our glorification of God does not enhance God in any particular. Well, we've looked at three reasons then why, why God did not make us why did He? I can only give you this answer and let you think upon it, mind the richness that is resident within it. Think about it more for yourself. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 says that God is love. One of the implications of that affirmation is that everything that God does issues from His love. Everything. He made us because He saw us before He made us and loved us. Not only is that the case, but think about this. He not only saw us before He ever made us, before this earth was ever fashioned, but He saw us as flawed individuals, as people who would stray. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 1, for example, the first few verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, that before the foundation of the world, God formulated the plan of human redemption through the shedding of Christ's blood. So He loved us. Why He loved us? I don't know. We can't fathom that. But He made us because somehow or another, 
It is an expression of His love. That moves me deeply. It is a thrilling thought to contemplate. Think on it. Meditate on it. Thank you.